Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm here with John Weller, the preacher. I'm Todd Saunders, the outsider. And we got Jason Goldberg, the dealer. Jason, this place is unbelievable. I don't think I've been to a flooring, I've never been to a flooring store anything like this. How many people do you have working here? We have 400 plus people. Oh my God. But I assume it wasn't always 400 people. Like, how many people was it when you guys started? So we started with six of myself. So seven total? Seven total, okay. yeah. And then we just grew and grew and grew, and here we are today at 400 plus, 22 years later. And what year did you start the business? 2000. Okay, so from 2000 to 2022, you grew from you know six or seven people to 400 people. Yes. I mean, I, the thing that stands out to me, as I've been to 8,000 flooring stores, and I've, I've been there for loads, I've been there as crews go out, I have never been to a flooring store where two things, the owner is not involved in the in everything that's going on at all times, and it's not chaos. I mean, it literally is silent around here, and I don't understand. Or it I, seems silent around here, and there's stuff happening well, behind the scenes. So I would tell you what you're observing is, in my opinion, a really good thing. We know how to scale. And when you set processes and procedures in place, and you have great people, and you train them well, and you give them responsibility and accountability for their roles, then I shouldn't have to do their jobs. Like they're capable of doing what, what, what they're here to do, and I can do them what I need to do, which is strategy and growth and training and process and all these other things. So yeah, you can work on your business, not in your business. Correct. Which a lot of us can't do. I know one thing that I do is I have a note, I have like a sticky pad on my computer. And I have the three things I can do that no one else can do. And if I'm not doing one of those three things, it reminds me to say, why am I doing this? Why isn't someone else doing this? Just a little kick in the ass to remember, like, there's only certain things that you can do. But to scale, you can't be doing things outside of these, you know, three or four core things. Yeah, I agree. And look, for like 12 years, I, you know, I did it all. I did a lot of the daily stuff. And then, you know, as you grow and grow and grow, you got to change your focus on what you can. And actually meeting you, whatever, four plus years ago, and watching how you run your business and how you just kind of, you know, you focus on what you do and you let your team focus on what they do, which is awesome in my opinion. So I've kind of, you know, watched some of the things you do and realized that you're doing it the same way, which made me actually focus even more on, well, maybe I do put my nose into things more often than I should, but, um, you know, I enjoy doing it. Yeah, giving people that responsibility too, like is what a lot of people look for and want in a role. I'm curious though, as we kind of get into this, John, what, how many people were Floor Force when Floor Force got started? Well, there's two stories to Floor Force getting started. One was like Ariana Grande's right. you know, cousin or something. <laughs> Ariana Grande's father was our creative director, and we had a CEO who was actually a, somebody from the flooring industry. Can I just that ask was you right there, in. what's yes. your favorite Ariana Grande song? I couldn't tell you. Me neither. Do you know any? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> All right, anyway, keep going. Anyway, so we had. You know, I had actually started a distribution company and had a really rough time with the operational side of it. And after doing that for five years, when Mark Loberbaum decided to help partner with me and start Floor Force, I asked, I requested to not be the CEO of that company, but to run the marketing and sales, which is really what I felt was my core competency. So we had a different CEO. Three and a half years later, Mark said, the I want you to run the company. Well, but when you when you ran the company, how many employees were you then? Yeah, so we st well, I took over. There was 23 employees. I scaled all the way down to three. <laughs> and honestly, <laughs> no, I did it on purpose. Yeah. I felt like we had we needed an absolute culture change in that company. How'd you do that? Let's actually, let's stop right there for a second. Going from 23 employees down to three is hard, right? We've had to lay off people in the past. I don't know if you guys have had to lay off people for any situation. I mean, firing one or two people is different than laying off or saying 20 people, they have to go. What was your first layoff like of going from 23 to three people? Because that's a lot of people to let go. Yeah, I had to look in the mirror and convince myself that this was survival and this was the right thing to do and it's what had to happen. And so I read a lot of books. Actually, Richard Branson's The Virgin Way was the book that propelled me into this thought process to go without the right culture and the right people, you can't build anything. The foundation's broken. You're not gonna, you won't be able to scale a company. So I literally took some words out of that book, convinced myself this was the right move, walked into the room and started with the receptionist. 
And so uh, how did you do it? You, John walks in, he reads this book, he wakes up, he reads this book, and he he goes to the receptionist and he says what? I said, can you come outside and join me? I wasn't going to do this. We were all in one room, a very small room, as a matter of fact. Brought the reception out, thanked her for all the hard work, and said, listen, the company is going through some massive changes. We're going to do a reset, and unfortunately, you're not going to be with the company. It was tough. So you but did to be 20, honest at with you, 20 at a time? We did. We had such a bad culture, though, but each time that I was talking to these people, I felt the burden leaving me, and knowing that I was going to have a, cam a clean canvas. What year was this? Wow. This was like 11 years ago. So Okay. So you went down to, to three people. And I want to talk about how you scaled back up. But Jason, have you had to do that? So the short answer is yes, but we, we did it differently. So we've had some challenging times. Some were self-imposed, right? Sometimes we Self-imposed as in like you fired them? No, or like, like we made, I made business mistakes that caused us not to be in a position that we were not making the kind of money sure. we needed. So then I do something about it. What we did in the early years was I would cut my salary down to nothing, and then I would, my top team would would take a pay cut that I would then later pay back when things. And got you would back. do that to save jobs, essentially. And we want to get rid of any of it. Yeah. And then during the Great Recession, you know, in two thousand seven eight, we we did probably let go a handful of people. So you that's actually so was that at the beginning of the Great Recession? Was that when you thought it was going to happen in the middle of it? Because no. right now we're kind of entering a recession as well. So what no, we, stage of the recession? Well, first of all, it was 2007 and eight, and we weren't the company we were today. Sure. So we didn't have as much money as we have now. It was in the recession where I just looked and said, look, we've got to, we've just got to let go a few people. And the reality is, is the people that, that we did let go probably needed to be let go anyways. Every, that's like the reaction of everyone after they let people go is they realize you probably should let go of those people anyway and we're getting just as much work done without those people. Yeah. Um, I've heard that from many CEOs that I work with in tech. So what did you go from how many employees down to how many during the Great Recession, roughly? I don't even remember, but I think we let go a total of maybe you know, between five and seven. It wasn't a ton. Okay. For the size that we were how did you do it individual meetings and yeah so you know with me it's always the direct supervisor will will handle it for their for their unit yeah there's no good way to do that at all for us we had to when we acquired floor force we had a ton of redundant roles and i wanted we wanted to keep everyone but it just didn't really make sense and there's no good way to do it so we let go of i think 10 people in the office but what got worse was then a few months later uh COVID hit and we had to do it over Zoom. And let me tell you, letting people go over Zoom is like painful for both parties. And just, that. it's not, you can't connect with the person. All right, so you guys went from like 23 people down to three people. And when we acquired you guys. We were back to 22 people. Back to 22 people. So back to square one. So how, what was your hiring philosophy to go from three to 22? And similar to Jason, I'm curious, how, how would you define the floor force culture? Yeah, so we were looking for, I mean, because we were in such a bad place culture-wise and there was no camaraderie around the team, actually, I think it was almost competitive where other teams wanted to succeed but didn't want the other part of the company to succeed. So I wanted to erase all that and create a cohesive group. And I'll be honest with you, the process was, it helped me grow as a person, as a business leader. I started hiring these people myself, feeling like I was the most capable person to find someone and find out who they were and what they were all about and bring them in. And I was the only person other than maybe the manager would come in. And the I mean, manager, there were three people. I, I, yeah, the person who was going to be over this person would come into this conversation. But to be honest with you, I wasn't self-aware until about the third or fourth person that I hired. And they, a couple of them already were showing signs of great interview, not the best employee. And so I reached out to a company named Robert Half, which does a lot of recruiting for the tech business, for the tech community. And I went through that process and I realized I had never had a recruiter before on staff or I've worked with one. Big companies like that don't really get to know your business and the ethos of your business. And they just start throwing you at bodies, hoping something sticks. So I was spending an enormous amount of time now going through these candidates that they picked. And through that, I was like, there has to be a, a recruiter that I can actually get to understand what we're doing. So I found a small recruiting agency, spent the time to really educate them on what we were doing. And once I did that and realized it was a process that they would do that I would never do, like three interviews for every single person, 
Um, I was getting candidates that, number one, had ch checked all these boxes that I wouldn't necessarily go through um, in a single interview or even two interviews. And I started to get quality people. And once I got into that rhythm with a really good recruiting agency, we scaled very quick and were able to scale the company. And it took it off my shoulders. You, you, I'm just laughing a little bit because you said that you don't like recruiters, yet you're married to recruiters. So, like, it's a little <laughs> comical here that you don't like recruiters. No, 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 no. A large recruiting company like Robert Half. Like, yeah, I found a boutique company. And you found a wife. Yeah. Okay, I, yeah. So. yeah, that's a funny part of the story. But what I realized is, listen, not all recruiters are the same, but I think a lot of business owners need to be very aware of themselves if you're not going to spend the time and the resources to interview the way that you need to, which can be more than one conversation, maybe even three, and do a background check, you're probably not going to get great people. And a lot of business owners won't do that. So you, you should think about having a recruiter. That's what we built our company on, and it worked. And when you guys both scaled down, I mean, something we say in tech is like, don't forget cancer spreads. And if you have a cancerous employee, it spreads just like cancer, the disease, and other people start to get cancerous. And all of a sudden, that one person has affected 20 people. It has affected 30 people. I can promise you that the transformation of, of the company that I saw was the most miraculous and magical thing. Everyone, the people that we have, and you know that today. Think about today. We're four and a half years after acquisition. And think about the employees that came over. They're still some of our most loyal of and course. hardworking people because they were they bought into the mission from day one and they haven't left it. Yeah. And back to Jason's point, it's hard to find great people that are passionate, hardworking, and are committed to a mission. And if you're going to lay people off, Jason might hire him, so watch the <laughs> f*** out. <laughs> I don't want the bad ones, just the good ones. Okay, so, so we've seen how a company can go from you know, 30 employees down to three or you know, lose seven employees, whether that's through strawberries or through Zoom or through, you know, probably doing it the right way like Jason did. But how about building back up? I think a lot of, a lot of people now are talking about how do I hire the right people? How do I hire installers? How do I hire the best employees? You look around this place and like, it's working. It's operating, it's working. Like who are the key roles for you guys and what do you look for when you hire people? Well, we look for culture fit. Look, hiring's tough, right? It's, it's in today's markets, it's tough. Uh, we may be going into recession, so I'm really looking forward to other people getting rid of people so I can hire them. <laughs> but to answer your question, we, we look for someone who's got kind of the, the same philosophies that we do. They, they want to work hard. They, they don't mind if we put a lot of different things on them. They enjoy training. They want to constantly train. They care, which is probably the number one thing. If you just give me someone who cares... I can teach them the rest. Yeah, most me, people don't care. Finding sorry, people that cares is hard. Well, in today's environment, I've never seen so many people who simply don't care. Well, we have people that refuse to go, don't want to go to an office, you know, want four-day work weeks. What else do they want in tech? Four-day week, re office, free food. and. But don't and get me started on tech because <laughs> tech has ruined it for everybody. I mean, they have. This are, is crazy. Are people demanding free massages and food here? Or what First, no one here demands anything. <laughs> but, you know, everyone's respectful of each other. But we run our business like a business should re be run. We have regular work weeks. We All those things that the tech companies do, that they can do because they make the most absurd profits. Yeah. It, look, if you're Google and you have that much money, of course you can do it. Since the average business can't do that. Yeah. And, and so and then everyone's on social media all the time. And they see all this nonsense that people post that's coming from the tech companies that a flooring company or most of us blue collar companies, we cannot do it. Like it's not, we don't have the margins to do it. Yeah. So it's really making it difficult. Well, but, but Can I just push back? Yeah. So you mentioned culture. Yeah. Do you, how do you define AFS culture? And during an interview process, do you have someone that like, your interview is to make sure on your team, like you're the culture person. Your interview is the competency person. So we, we have a, a structured interview question sheet that we put together over the years. It's a, a series of questions that you ask. And it doesn't like, I know a lot of companies go, well, you start here and then you interview with this person and interview with this. We don't do it that way. The unit leader, they, needs a per they need a person. They get an ad up and then they start bringing in people and then they interview. And they run their own process. They run their, they build the, we have an HR hiring pipeline in RLM. Yeah. 
So that gets in there with no sensitive information. So that's a whole new thing. Yeah. You use RLM for an HR hiring pipeline as and well. And it's, it's amazing. Is there you, any other dealer that you think he does that? I don't know. I mean, when I used to own RLM, I would occasionally bring it up with dealers. Like, you don't even understand what you can do with some of the pipelines if you get creative. I have an installer prospecting pipeline. I have like, when you start thinking about the uses that, that what you can do, most people aren't getting creative. That's why to me, it's such a, hugely valuable tool, but we use RLM in our hiring process. So I can monitor every position we're hiring for, what stage we're in of the hiring process. Like, are we at background check? Are we at, are we at assessments? Are we at, so we build the process in RLM. Like, here's the steps you follow. Here's the questions you ask. And we have all these different fields where you're recording data. And then I can follow along. But eventually when we get someone who cares, who's a good fit, and are these like cult the things you're saying right now? Are these culture things that if I went around to someone around here and I said, "What is the mission of AFS or what is the culture of AFS?" Would they know these lines? No, or is the, this, this culture thing would be if you worked here for a couple of days, you would just get a feel for how we run. Gotcha. Makes sense. Which look, when I acquired, I've acquired two companies. You didn't get that same feel in some of these other ones, and, and I missed it things, huh? when I bought it. Right, so we've had to, we've had to work really hard to get our culture, which means we've 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 had we've turned a lot of people who left on their own because they didn't want to do it the way that we do it, which is fine. I'd rather you you leave now than later. Speaking about leaving now or later, uh, I'm curious. You're you're a um, to the point guy. Yeah. Have you ever been in an interview where you just knew it wasn't going to work? And just to save time, you were like, because I can imagine you being in an interview and be like, yeah, no, I'm sorry. This is done. Yeah. I have one. We were, we were, we were hiring for a position. We had a candidate out of Florida. That I didn't speak to, but someone else on my team did and said, this person's going to be really good for us. Was it a high up role or? It was, the position was a higher up role. So we flew her in. We were supposed to spend the whole day with her. She got here. My guy picked her up from the airport. We were sitting in the conference room. I talked to her for about 15 minutes. I excused myself from the room. I went into my office. I went immediately online to see when the next flight back to where she came. <laughs> I told my assistant, I said, rebook her. On this flight, then I called my guy out of the room. I'm not going to say his name. The guy who set up for me, I said, I just said his name. <laughs> I, said, I said, you are going to take her, thank her for coming. You're going to take her to the airport. I've got her booked on a flight that leaves in 90 minutes. We're sending her back. So I knew right away I wasn't going to waste my time or her time. Yeah. And I learned a valuable lesson. I should have done a phone interview with her first before I paid to fly her and all the way And from some Florida. people might feel like that's a savage move, but the truth is, like, the most valuable thing we all have in our lives is time. So yeah. you, you probably did a lot of things that day that was way more important than interviewing someone you knew that wasn't going to get the job. And she got to go home and probably see her family. Yeah, right? I'm, look, I'm, sure, and, I'm sure she wasn't happy in the moment when it happened because, like, you wouldn't expect that. Like, you wouldn't fly all the way from Florida to meet with the CEO of a company and me put you on an airplane an hour later. Walk out of the room and not basically. I didn't talk. I mean, it, it was a kind of a savage move, but it needed. It was the right move at the time, I felt. I but I learned some lessons from it. That was a number of years ago. Right in the thick of the recession, you laid off a bunch of folks, and you, you know, I think all of us now see a recession is most likely on the horizon. Like, do you have any advice for dealers now, looking back at some of the mistakes or things yeah, you did I right do. on the previous one? I do. I'm going to skip past the recession. I'm going to go to when COVID hit. Most people laid people off. We did not. We actually hired people through COVID. And if you look from the last two years or two and a half years till now, we had the most growth in those, we you know, almost grew $100 million in that period of time. So to me, you have to use challenging times wisely. You can lay off people, but I'm just telling you, like we're in a position where we're not gonna lay anyone off. Like we're gonna be looking for you to, other people are laying them off, and then we're gonna look to be hiring those people, especially the good ones. And to me, that's where, like you have to get creative. If you're the owner and you're, Paying yourself two hundred thousand, maybe you need to drop down to one hundred twenty-five and use that seventy-five to keep some talented people. The recession will be over, but your business, where is it going to be at the end of it? Were you in a position to scale it up like we did during COVID, or did you scale down and now you got to start building yourself all the way back up? And guess what? You don't have any of those good people anymore. You lost them all to me. So you want to be in position. To, to be able to capitalize on that For stuff. For sure. People are your greatest asset, and they're the hardest to find. So if you lose those people, like, good luck trying to find them again. Yeah. The other thing that's challenging right now is, look, aside from recession and inflation, and people are in, are and in Russian high, wars. And Russian you know, wars yeah. and 
a short supply of everything, it's, it's difficult to find that person that wants to work at a job for an extended period of time. So if you've got an employee and they've been with you for 10 years and now all of a sudden, you know, we've entered a recession, all these other things, and you're gonna lay someone off, you know, you may lose that. That's the one I want because I know that person. Dependable, honest. Yeah, and then we're gonna teach them our way. And they're, they're, they're either gonna, one of two things is gonna happen. They're gonna love it or they're gonna hate it. Well, third and thing could happen. What? They could get to the interview and you can fly them back home. <laughs> <laughs> but if they hate it, they're gonna know pretty quick. And so are we. And then we're gonna part ways pretty fast. But if they love it, which the vast majority do, because most people like responsibility and accountability, like, and them to be left alone if they can work within those parameters, especially if they're aggressive and they like to win. So, you know, hopefully a lot of those people become available or alternately, hopefully those of you listening don't lose those people. Those people are going to be really valuable. And I'm telling you, I want to hire them. All right. And we're out of time here. We got John Weller, the preacher, myself, Todd, the outsider, and Jason, the savage dealer. Until next time.